Good morning. Beautiful sunny day today. My name is Jimmy Mack. I'm the worship director here at Orchard Community Church, and we're so glad that you're with us this morning, both in person and online. If you're here for the first time, I want to offer a special welcome to you and let you know that we're excited that you're here, and we have a gift for you at our welcome table, so be sure to pick that up. That's my official reading, but uh, Matt is not here today. He's on vacation, and uh, I'm running the show. So let me say a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, Pastor Matt is able to get some long-needed rest and relaxation. We pray that he would have a great time this week. Uh, we uh, greatly miss him, but Father, bless this time together as we worship you in song and in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing. Oh, by the way, do you notice a new face up here? Hello. You notice? Hello. This is Elias. This is Harold's grandson, Elias. And he has a beautiful voice and he has a heart for Jesus. And he's going to sing with us today. Nice to meet all of you. I'll be over here for a meet and greet. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah, louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, 
Let me hear you all shout, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Doesn't it feel good to say that? Let's do it one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be. here with us this morning. Please be seated. Okay, Pastor Matt is on vacation this week, as I already mentioned, and there is a special mystery guest who's going to be doing the sermon today. I won't tell you who he is. Um, anyway, Josh Matthews is going to be with us this morning. He's ill, so say a prayer for Josh and for his family. I think his kids are sick too. 
So he just couldn't make it. So you'll find a digital bulletin for the service in the Uversion Bible app. There's also a button at the top of the stream for you streaming people out there. A link to our weekly email. Be sure to fill out the connection card, prayer request card, summer collections, flip-flops, shoes, clothes, food, and hygiene items. Put those items in the bins near the second table. Is that over this way? Okay, by that table over there if you have anything for our summer collections. An evening with Ramazan Arkan. Did I say that right? Uh, he's our mission partner in Turkey. And that's Tuesday, July 23rd. Did I get that right? 7 to 9 p.m. at the Dinkler home. Pete and Sandy. The youth ministry and men's ministry are having a joint event at Dave and Buster's. Who's Buster? No, Dave and Buster's. You know, you guys know. On Wednesday, July 24th, meet in the church parking lot between 6 to 16, 6.15 to carpool. The youth also have an overnighter here on Saturday night. Uh, there's a Walk for Tender Life maternity home on July 27th. Meet at the church at 8.15 to carpool. The walk is at 9 o'clock at the River Community Church. And, of course, join us for the Lemon Festival August 4th. Are you guys excited about that? August 4th after church. So I was informed that Matt said barbecue last time, and he was wrong. Uh, it's not a barbecue. It's the taco truck. So if you like tacos better than barbecue, then make sure you come for that. And, of course, there's lots of activities. It's going to be a real fun day. So... Anyway, that's, those are uh, announcements of things. We, uh, don't you love Orchard Church? We have so many things that are always going on around here. So if, uh, you know, look around to see if you're new here, look around to see because there's always something fun to be uh, involved in around here. So if we can have Janine come forward right now, she has a message for our kids. Oh my gosh, summertime. We've got, it's so exciting that it's summertime. I have some neighbors and, uh, they have lots of grandchildren. And the other day I was listening to them play on the slide, screaming memes, playing on the slide. But I really want to get one. Clover, I love your haircut. <gasps> Lovely. That is so beautiful. I'm sorry. You can see why I work well in children's ministry. I can get easily distracted. Um, so, uh, I was thinking to myself, gosh, I haven't heard that in a long time. And I realized it's because it's summertime. So they all have to come to grandma's. All the grandkids have to come to grandma's house while people are working. So I have no idea where you are this summer, where who's having to watch you, who's coming around. But I always get excited about coming to church because this is the place that I love. And so I've been at church quite a few. Oh. Here, another distraction. We have a bug on the rug. <laughs> oh, look at There you got him. Okay. Um, so it is a big deal. When you're, when you're in kids' ministry, a bug is a big deal. Okay. So um, anyway, I was thinking this, uh, this week about the concept of church and what we like about church. And I knew I was going to be missing my friend. My friend... Uh, I've started sitting with her this year and she is the greatest friend because she's all about love. She is the kind of person that I want to be around all the time because she's happy and she's loving. And if I sit with her, I know I'm going to get lots of hugs and um, she even actually will go to people at the church and give them little presents, which is very fun. And I don't know if any of you know who this is, but I'm missing my friend Bailey. Bailey Hoyt, who is now on vacation. And I was thinking about that and in my kitchen where there's not as much love in my kitchen. <laughs> Sometimes people don't clean up after they put butter on their toast. And I get to do that. Sometimes they don't rinse their dishes and put them in the dishwasher. Sometimes they pour out the old coffee and then the sink gets stained because they don't rinse it out. I'm sure I don't really do any of those things, do I? But 
God has to remind me because those aren't really bad things that these people are doing. And so he showed me this pretty sign that I keep in my kitchen, which is actually the place where I need to have it the most because it reminds me what's the most important thing to God. Because God says that there's faith and there's hope, but there's something that's more, more important than faith or hope. And this is a scripture that we always read at weddings, but I think we should read it every Sunday to remind us about what God wants, because do you guys know what the greatest of those three is? Hope, faith, and, oh, they knew, love. And this is this verse that I have to keep in my kitchen so that I can remember how to respond like Jesus. It says, love is patient, and love is kind. You can read it with me if you want. It does not envy. It does not boast. In other words, it's not saying, hey, look how great I am. Look how great I am that I cleaned up after my toast. I mean, no, it doesn't. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking, and it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Don't you love that? That that's the way God wants us to be, that we're not keeping track of every bad thing that somebody's done. So God wasn't really happy with me keeping track of who didn't clean up after toast, was he? Okay. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. And this is what Jesus calls us to do in our life. And I'm thankful for my friend, Bailey, who does that with me. And I want to be more like that. So let's all go to children's ministry activities and continue on with our service. I think we have prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your ways are not our ways. You are perfect, holy. You are creator of the universe. You are our way maker. You make a way to, for us to come to you. And once you have initially saved us, you begin changing us and conforming us to your ways. As you mold us, we pray that we won't resist. But when we do, Lord, forgive us. We thank you that if we confess our sin to you, you hear us and cleanse us and remember the sin no more. Thank you. We pray for our church body here at Orchard, praying that we would continue to encourage and love each other. We pray for our church staff as many will be vacationing. Give them refreshment. And farther from home, we pray for our foreign missionaries, specifically Nita Hansen, as she travels the long trip from Ukraine to Florida. And for Ramazan and his family as they visit Ventura this week. Thank you that we are united in you. In Jesus' name and in your Holy Spirit, amen. And now's the time of the service where we can joyfully give back a portion of what he's given to us.
please stand as we sing they that wait upon the Lord they that wait upon the Lord shall renew Sing that again. They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait. They that wait. They shall mount up. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not be dead away. Dead away. Dead away. Upon the Lord. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal.
for the morning. Oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Amen. And you may be seated. And at this time, I'd like to have our mystery speaker come forward. Oh, wait, he's already here. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you remember a few weeks ago, uh, Dave Donaldson, faithful Dave, who's always here every week behind the scenes helping us out, gave a testimony of his mother with dementia and how she had gotten lost. And the thing that I loved about that testimony is that all of the... You have to bear with me sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes I get overwhelmed, but I get over it. Uh, but the, thi the thing that we all should have got from that was there were se several things that happened leading up to him finding his mother. And he could have said, well, that was a coincidence. Well, boy, wasn't I lucky? Oh, wow, it just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But he didn't. He said, I think God spoke to me. I think God led me. I think God allowed this to happen. God allowed that to happen. So it's, it's part of living a life as a Christian with your eyes open and having faith and belief that God is real and he loves you and he's involved in every part of your life. When you lose your keys and your car won't start, he's there and he cares. And, and we sometimes just kind of put him somewhere and we don't make them real in our life for a while. And we just go through motions. Matt has been talking about that. And then some, usually what draws us back is something cataclysmic. When something really big happens in our life. And then all of a sudden we go running to God. You know, I need you. I need you. You need God when you can't find your keys. You need him when your car won't start. You know, when you're looking for your mom. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are real. You love us. You are here. Help us to keep our eyes open. Help us to live our lives in a true, real faith. Help us to look for you in everything. Help us to see you in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, James 1.3 says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. John 11.40 says, Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see gl the glory of God? Mark 11.24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in, in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the insurance, assurance about what we do not see. James 1.6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And my favorite, one of my favorites, is Hebrews 11.6 and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. All of us at times in our life face uh, moments of, of doubt and faith and, and decision when we have a major decision. Is it time for me to move to Oregon? Is it, you know, is it time for this? Is it time to sell my house? Is it, you know... And, and I, in my life, I've learned through many things that have taken place, um, and I'm thankful for this, that I've really learned how to stop and listen and, and really hear God's voice. And how many, how many people here feel like you've actually heard the voice, <laughs> the voice of God in your head? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing because... He does speak to us, but most of the time we're too loud and noisy and busy and frantic, and we don't hear his voice. But the times that you do, for me in my life, those are signposts of faith that he did speak to me. 
this did happen. He is real. And with that strength, I can move forward. I'd like to sing a song now. And the, there's an extra sheet in your bulletin. And I, I love this song. Because it talks about that very thing of keeping our eyes open. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Sing with me. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you. So this is, uh, I, don't, I don't have a sermon. I was going to do uh, predestination and go in depth on that this morning. But since I found out that I was doing this about four o'clock yesterday, uh, I'll give you something I know a lot about, and that's my testimony. So I'll share with you some things about you. I've been here 12 years. I know most of you here, uh, but um, born and raised in Anaheim and, and Buena Park area, and um, somehow I was raised in the Catholic Church for a couple of years. And uh, somehow in my heart, I always believed God was real, but I didn't really understand what he wanted from me or what it meant to walk in faith or anything like that. I just knew that I believed. And I also went through uh, a rough time in my life where I actually believed I was going to hell. I don't know if anybody here uh, has ever felt like that, um, but I, I really thought that I wasn't good enough to go to heaven. And I thought, I really did, I thought I was going to hell. I thought, I hope I don't die now because I'm going to end up in hell and I don't want to end up there. So my mother died when I was 11. Five boys, my poor dad. Uh, he, was, he went to a group, it was called Parents, Parents Without Partners, I think, PWP. And uh, I just imagine all these women, my dad was tall and handsome, and I imagine all these women, they'd see him and go, hey, there's a man, and they'd see five <laughs> You know, big, tall, rowdy, long-haired, shabby boys and say, you know, um, this, this guy over here looks better. So my poor dad, you know, was, was looking for a new partner for a long, long time. So we kind of grew up without a mother. And we did. We kind of strayed. My dad was busy just trying to take care of the house and take care of five boys and uh, grew my hair long. And my brothers did, too. And we got into wild things. I was uh, really thought I was going to be a rock star someday. So I kind of lived that wild lifestyle so uh, long hair rock and roll band smoking cigarettes feeling cool so anyway the first time God really reached out to me uh, specifically reached out to me there was a woman that worked in the office and I always thought she wore way too much makeup but uh, 
I'm, I'm going to guess she was probably somewhere in her mid-20s, but she invited me to lunch. And I thought, is she hitting on me? Or what? I mean, what's, why, why does she want to take me to lunch? You know? And so I went to lunch with her. I, no clue, but I was excited. I thought, this is kind of neat. This woman wants to take me to lunch. She told me the plan of salvation. So she picked this wild, rowdy, long-haired, cigarette smoking kid and God spoke to her and said I want you to talk to him tell him about Jesus she gave me a Bible she signed it I still have it to this day I tossed it in a drawer I thought yeah one of these days I'll, I'll start reading my Bible so I wasn't really ready yet to make any kind of major change in my life and then one day probably a couple of months after that, she said, I had a dream about you. I said, really, you had a dream about me? Yes, I did. I almost, I almost can't even say it. She said, you were playing piano in church. And I said, well, number one, I don't go to church. Number two, I play guitar, I don't play piano. I said, I don't know, that was the dream. I saw you and you were playing piano in church. So years later, uh, when I started college, uh, I was just interested in the piano. I always was, but we didn't have one in our house. <clears throat> so I took piano in college, started learning to play. And one day somebody asked me, would you play a song for a special music that we were doing? And as I was getting, we practiced, rehearsed, and, you know, everything was great on the keyboard. And I play piano a lot now. You don't see me play it a lot, but I do. And... Uh, I was getting ready to start and I just started bawling because of the vision that she had had years before came true. She got, opened her eyes and she saw me in the future playing piano. I, I didn't learn the piano because she said that I had totally forgotten. So God gave me a vision through her and through her faithfulness of something that was going to happen in my life in the future. So I share all these things to say, when you have a milestone like that in your life, set a altar, set a signpost in your life and say, God was real, God was real, God was real here. He was, he was real there. And then when you have a test of faith, you look back at those things and you say, but he did this, he did this, he did that. So at, uh, but anyway, I, I didn't change my lifestyle. I wasn't ready for it. And um, when I graduated high school, <clears throat> I took a job in a factory and this big burly bearded man was scary. He was the foreman on the floor and I was just a grunt running things around. And uh, he pulls me aside one day and he says, and I have my hair in a ponytail, long hair. And he says, hey, I hear you playing a rock band. I'm like, I'm a cool rock. I'm going to be a rock star someday. And he says, you know, we have rock bands to play at our church. Just out of the blue. We have rock bands to play at our church. I said, rock bands in church? Yeah, Calvary Chapel. I don't know if anybody remembers that back in the 70s. That reached a lot of people. There were a lot of people that never would have gone to church. If anybody saw that movie, Jesus Re Revolution, I was in that. I, that was a part of my life. And I thought, well, that's cool. I just... I mean, I don't know how I fit into that. And he gave me a book. I still remember, and I still have it. It's in my office here at the church. It's called Clap Your Hands by Larry Tomzak. And he says, this, the guy in this book reminds me of you. And it was a guy's testimony. And the guy talked about uh, going through a lot of the same things I had gone through and how people had approached him and talked to him about Jesus. And then at the end of the book, he actually told how he prayed to accept Christ and, and how his life changed and all this. And, I, and I, I'm reading this book. I'm thinking, I want that. I want that. I'm, I want to change my life. I want to be that person. And so uh, I thought, I could do that. I could do that. So this is the kind of real faith that I had. So I, I made a commitment. I'm going to do it. And I was in my bed at night. And I prayed. And I thought, I'm going to hear God's voice. And I'm thinking, does he sound like Charlton Heston? Is he, you know, what is what does God's voice sound like? Because I really believed I was, gonna, you know, and I thought my dad's down the hall. Is my dad going to hear it? 
my brother's going to hear it, you know, is, you know, is it going to shake the house? Is there going to be fog, you know? So at 18 year old intelligent kid, I actually had that kind of faith, a childlike faith that I was actually going to hear his voice. So I waited and waited. I prayed. I waited and waited and waited. Felt like I never slept at all. And I woke up in the morning. I felt so refreshed. And I just had a sense inside that God was speaking to me all night. That he had, he had come in. And he had spoken to me and said, you're mine at 18. So one of the first, first tests, because I, again, with that kind of faith, just an innocent, pure faith, I turned to God and I said, God, the one thing I can't do, I can't quit smoking. I was actually smoking two packs a day at 18. And of course, I didn't have a mother. You don't do that. You know, I didn't have somebody. My dad was gone all the time. And, and it, my friends, it was cool. But I had tried many, many times. Any, any of you have ever smoked? It's really hard. It's easy to start. It's really hard to quit. And uh, um, I said, God, you can do this. And I believed. Grabbed my cigarettes, put them on my dresser, went to bed. I woke up the next morning, crumpled it, threw it in the trash, never looked back. I, I just, I can't stand the smell of smoke. And I knew, I knew that I couldn't have done that. And so, again, I put a signpost in the ground and said, God did that. And so when I, I, through the years, I've met many people that are struggling, many Christians that are tr struggling to quit smoking. And I can't guarantee that that will happen to everybody, but I love sharing that testimony with people and saying, just try it, just try it. But you have to really believe, because I did, I, I really did believe when I went to bed that night, I really believed that he could do it, and he did. So I got a lot of stories, so I gotta keep an eye on my time here. So if I'm going too long, somebody, somebody go like this, cut, cut, cut. So there's a reason why I'm still holding my guitar, by the way, in case anybody's wondering, why, does it, why is he holding that guitar? Is it a crutch? So that was the first real big test of God, and he proved himself at that point. So from that point, I was really excited about being a Christian. And I tell people when I tell my testimony that if the, if the doors to the church were open, I was in it. Every Bible study, every fellowship, every single thing I could get into church, I did. And I met my wife in church and at college and career group. So here, this is a this is a cute story, and I shouldn't get choked up on this one. But I had had I don't know where I got it from. I had this really gaudy tie, and I was I I had started work at a, at a bank. I was a bank teller, and I was applying for a job, and I had this gaudy tie that said Jesus. It was like a neon sign, Jesus, Jesus, you know. And I thought, you know, in my Christian circles, I thought it was really cool. So I'm going to apply for a, a job that I really wanted. And I looked in my closet. I saw that Jesus tie. I was like, no, no, I can't wear that. They're, they're never going to hire me. They're going to look, you know, who is this nutcase with this crazy Jesus neon tie? And, and God spoke to me and said, are you ashamed? Are you ashamed of me? Are you proud of me? I didn't think I'd get choked up talking about that. But... I thought, you know what, I'm not. I'm going to wear that tie. And I put on that tie, and I got the job. The, the interviewer never said anything like, that's, that's a funny tie, or, you know, are you Christian? You know, whatever. But anyway, I, it was like I, I heard a voice saying, are you ashamed? Or are you going to wear that tie? I had other ties. It was my only tie. And it really was more like a... Again, I'd wear it in Christian things and get a, you know, kind of a laugh or whatever, just because it was so obnoxious. But uh, anyway, I wore the tie. I got the job. So there's another point in my life where God worked through a situation and strengthened my faith because I believed, because I turned it over to his hands. I trusted in him. He proved himself. So anyway, I, I quickly moved up the ranks in banking. I became a branch manager, vice president of a commercial bank, making million-dollar loans. Uh, I don't know if anybody knew that about me, but uh, 
I didn't like it. I, did, I, I felt out of place. I kept thinking, uh, you know, I even kept thinking, you know, church work. I thought I'd rather do church work or something, but I don't, I don't know how to shift careers. But I always loved music. And, you know, I gave up the being a rock star thing. I, and I cut my hair, you know, little by little, shortened it, you know, after I became a Christian. And uh, uh, so anyway, um, I was working in a bank and on the side I was doing lots of music. I played in a Christian band and, you know, did some recording and did other things like that. But it was always kind of a side thing. And uh, I started doing music arrangements for people just sitting at a computer if you guys know about this you know you can i can sit down and create an orchestra by myself on the computer one in, one instrument at a time i have the technology for that and i got good i've been doing it for a long long time and uh i had an opportunity it looked like a very small window but to actually jump from being a successful banker into a full-time musician and I thought, this is my dream. This would, you know, this is what I really want in life. And so I sat down, I prayed with God. I made a covenant. And I, I wrote my covenant inside the cover of one of my Bibles. I still have. And I said, God, if you will give me the dream of my life to do music, to get paid, Make a living doing music. The thing, the one thing I love more than anything else. I will serve you. I will do anything you want me to do. Uh, that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm standing right here. Yeah. From that day forward, I have always been involved in music and church and trying to bless people with whatever talent I have, whatever I can do, because that's my end of the covenant with God. And God, again, was faithful in his end. And, and from that day forward, I, I, I kept thinking, well, I can always go back into banking if I need to. I never needed to. And for those that don't know, I, I've done radio commercials. I've done hundreds of albums and stuff for people. But he gave me that desire in my heart, and he blessed me. And so... I love doing this, but I do this because that's my end of that covenant. And so a signpost in the ground. Again, I was faithful. He was faithful. I had a moment of trust in him, and he proved himself to me. So I was at a church, and things had gotten kind of uncomfortable. It was time for me to leave. I'd been leading worship in several churches, and... Uh, I thought, you know, I kind of need a break. And, and once I started doing worship, uh, I wasn't able to go to church with my family because I have to come away early and set up and do all this kind of stuff. I thought, you know, it'd be nice to, for a while, to uh, just go and sit with my family in a church. And I thought, you know, if I go to a really big church, I could just get lost. I can just, you know, enjoy really good music. So I found a church, over 6,000 people with an orchestra, 200 voice choir. Adia, if you're watching, can you imagine? And I thought, I can get lost here. This is great. So uh, me and the family, we all went, and we went together in the morning and sat there. And after about two weeks, Linda comes running up to me. She goes, I just talked to this girl named Deborah. She wants to talk to you right now. She needs to talk to you. I said, what happened? She said, well, she asked me what I did. And I said, well, he does music, and he leads bands, and he plays all these instruments, and da-da-da. She says, we need him. We need him. They had been trying for a year to build their contemporary service at that church, and they had been auditioning and trying people and all this kind of stuff. Next thing I know, I'm leading worship in a 6,000-member church for their contemporary service of only 1,000 people at that time. around. It built up to be about 1,000 people in the contemporary service because they had a huge massive they have one of the biggest organs it's eb free in fullerton if you've heard chuck swindoll's church he wasn't there at the time but uh big 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 church so anyway i wasn't in charge i was only in charge of the contemporary worship so they had been looking for somebody for the full position that was in charge of the orchestra and the choir and everything else i was also part-time because i had at that time i had a commercial recording studio and uh, 
they hired a new guy and he called me into his office and he said, hey, uh, so how's it going? I said, going great. I got about 30 people on my worship team and the service has been growing and, you know, da, da, da. he says, that's really nice. Okay, I, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to go ahead and do that service myself. So, you know, uh, let your people know, you know, and I don't need any of them. I'm, I'm going to do something totally different. And I bit my lips so hard it was bleeding on the way out because I thought, I don't want to say a cuss word. <laughs> Uh, because I was so upset and so angry and so confused. And it's like, God, you, you did you call me here? Am I doing what you want me to do? Is this this guy? You know, and I, I came home. I sat down on my keyboard and I started playing. And I said, God, this guy and this situation and da, 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 and God said, it's you and me. That's all there is. That's all that matters is you and me. Can you keep your eyes on me? Because it's just you and me. And I said, yes, God, I can. I can keep my eyes on you. He says, I have a plan for you, but you don't know it yet. So I sat down and a song just flowed out. And I've been playing this song, several churches, this song, people are singing this in Africa and other places, it's gone, it went on a guy's album that I produced. And uh, I think this song has blessed a lot of people, but it was given to me at that moment. And it's called Follow You, and I'd like to sing it. Not my will, but yours be done. I'm following the sun. I'll trust in you and I will obey. And if I'm the only one, until my life is done, I'll take my cross and I will follow you. Follow you, follow you. I'll live my life for you. It's the least that I can do. Follow you, follow you. I'll take my cross and I will follow you. Not my will, but yours be done. I'm following the sun. I trust in you and I will obey. And if I'm the only one, until my life is done, I'll take my cross and I will follow you. I didn't know he was going to come up here, but this is my son, Tim, for any of you that don't know, and he is a, an amazing blessing. And believe it or not, I taught him to play the drums, but he eventually got way better. So we, we, had, we found other pe teachers that really knew how to play to take him to higher levels. Okay, so in my quest, 
through being let go of this church, wondering what I was, and God, and God really did at that time, he really did say, I have other plans for you. I get a phone call from a pastor that I'd worked from, and he said, I'm at a church in Ventura. Could you come out and help us with our sound? I said, yeah, 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 sure. So I drove, I didn't even know of Ventura. I didn't even know this area. And uh, the first time I came out, I said, this is heaven. This place is wonderful, beautiful, really a nice place. And I helped them with their sound. And then he said, hey, can you help me with something else? And they paid me. He said, I'll pay you. I know it's 100, it was 100 miles door to door. And uh, so I came out and helped him with something else. And then a little bit later, he says, uh, we just washed, lost our worship leader. And I love the way that you do worship. And I know it's 100 miles, but could you just for a few weeks come out on Sunday? You can come stay. We have a parsonage out here and it's empty and you can stay in it overnight. And, and then, you know, and so I did and they'd take me to lunch and just have a wonderful day. And I drive back to Diamond Bar. I was living in Diamond Bar at the time. And then after a while, he pulls me aside and says, would you ever consider moving to mentor? <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, just, I don't know, you know. And so I brought Linda out and showed her around. And we drove around and she said, I like that area and stuff. And they have neat schools close by. We lived uh, down in Midtown. Uh, the church was there. And, the, and again, there, he said, I have a free house for you. And I looked at the house and it was two bedrooms, two very, very small bedrooms. <laughs> one bath and I had three boys fast growing boys and uh, I said I don't know if I can fit in that house and I, I'm really not I, I own my house in Diamond Bar but I, I I said I don't know if I can afford a house out here in Ventura and he said would you consider it if we built onto the house I said you would do that to get me out here to Ventura he said yes we would they raised thirty thousand dollars And this is a Baptist thing, but they had a picture of a wheelbarrow on the wall. And it said, get Jimmy to Ventura. And it was the dollar amount of the wheelbarrow being filled as people were donating money to get me out. So while that was taking place, I was driving out every Sunday. I think I did that almost six months. Every Sunday, leading worship 100 miles away from where I lived. But I felt God was leading me into that. And so eventually, shorten the story, we're here in Ventura, and we love it. Uh, yeah, thank you. And so we were, th we were there at this church for almost 11 years, and the pastor retired. He's like a father to me. He lives in Oregon now, Pastor Cliff. And uh, he left the church, and after he left, things were just not the same. They were just things were going in a different direction. And I knew it was time for me to leave that church. And I thought, oh my gosh, I sold my house. I moved into a parsonage, a free house. And the wonderful thing about that was because I was living in a free house, uh, I had a lot of time. I didn't have to work as hard as I did when I had a recording studio. So I spent wonderful years with my boys, went to Boy Scout camp every summer with them and slept in the backyard and tents and did all these things and really got a chance to enjoy my kids at a wonderful age. So when it was ending there, I thought, what do I do now? Do I move back to Orange County? Do I, I have a, and oh, one of the other things, not only did they add on to the house, but the pastor who loved construction built a recording studio in the garage for me to, to do my recording. He actually was in there saws and drywall and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I had a recording studio. I had a free house. What do I do now? I've, I've got to have a recording studio if I'm going to, you know, continue doing what I do for a living. And um, so I'm trying to think of where to go from here. But, um, oh, oh, okay. So, so I'm at a real, this is the first real challenge of, of faith in my life because it's, I had no idea what to do at that point. I didn't have any clear path. I didn't, you know, I didn't know where to go, what to do. So I had always heard about, um, what's the scripture, Deuteronomy 9.25, I lay prostrate before the Lord. So I thought, I really have to hear his voice. So I spent hours in my studio at that house, on my face, I, I swear to you I did, on my face praying, 
and trying to be quiet and listen. Like, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. But I, I, I need to hear your voice. And he didn't speak right away. Time went. Time went. One of my mentors said, you know what, dude, you should start looking for an apartment or something. Well, if I get an apartment, um, you know, and we had saved a little bit of money. We sold our house, but I, most of the money from the house sale, I paid off a lot of the expenses I had from building a big recording studio. Um, and I just kept praying and praying and praying. No answer, no answer, no answer. But I thought, I'm just going to keep it up. I'm just going to keep it up, keep it up. Praying and praying and praying. All of a sudden, one day, I get a letter in the mail. And I opened it. It was from a life insurance, whole life insurance policy that we started when we came out. So 11 years into this whole life policy. Never even thought of it. It was kind of expensive, but I thought, well, it's a good savings thing. And there was a large face value on there that had built up that I didn't even realize. And in the letter, it said, this is your money. You can do whatever you want with this. You could buy a car or you could buy a house. And I looked at it and I said, wait a minute. This is a down payment for a house. So I knew a couple of realtors. I talked to uh, a couple of them, and they said, you can't afford to live in Ventura. You, can't, you need to find somewhere. You need to move to Bakersfield or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, there was a woman that had a, I had a chance meeting with her. She was the mother of Brian, my youngest son. She was the mother of one of his friends. And she'd given me a card and said, you know, if you're ever looking to buy or sell a house, you know, give me a call. So I got out her card. She met with me, and she said, we're going to get you into a house. We can do this. We can do this. And it really, I was not a real good candidate. The housing market was at a weird place, but it was right after the crash. So things had fallen. Yeah, I'd watched everything around me go up, you know, so expensive. And uh, she stayed with me. And through the course of the process to try to get our house that we're in now, she said three times... <laughs> I have never seen this in 30 years of selling real estate. I've never seen this happen. And I said, it's God. And then another thing happened. She said, I've never seen this. I'm serious. I have never seen this happen in, real, in, the, in my career as a real estate agent. Third time. I've never seen this happen. She had a loan broker. The broker, even at one point, said, I've never seen this. I've never seen this happen. And I kept saying, it's God. It's God. So... Uh, I'm getting close to the end in case anybody, I haven't seen anybody go like this yet. Uh, so, uh, but I, I need to share this. So anyway, we went looking at houses and we looked at a whole bunch that were in a price range that we could maybe afford. And there was one that I it just stood out and I, and I liked it. And I said, can we see that one? She goes, I think that's a little too much for you guys. And I said, well, can I just see it? It just looks really cool. And uh, we walked in the door and Linda walks in and she goes, I love this house. And I said, I looked at it and I thought, and it needed a lot of repairs, so that kind of helped a little bit. The price was down because it, it was a fixer-upper. And I was walking, walking around the house, and I heard a voice. And it said, it said you're going to have to fix this fence. You're going to have to pull these weeds. And it, it kind of felt good. I was just kind of cruising. I was like, I was hearing it. And you're going to have to paint this. And it's like, wait a minute. Why am I, why is this coming into my head? I, I don't even know if I can afford this house. But I heard a voice saying, these are the things you're going to have to do to make this house nicer. And from that point forward, I believed, I, I believed that God had told me that that's where he wanted me to live. And it's, I'm not bragging. I, you know, I'm thankful that I own a house. Very, very thankful. So the, the uh, uh, agent, um, so it, uh, what was I going to say? So anyway, in, in, in my prayers, this is really crazy. Another signpost in the ground. I said to myself, I said it to nobody else. I said, God, if you give us this house, I'm going to put a big sign right in the doorway, and it's going to say, God bless all who enter this house. God bless this house and all who enter. And I, I, I made that covenant with God. We finally got to the end. We got the house, got the keys. I got a really nice gift basket from my realtor. 
and there were some all these goodies in there, and there was a sign in the basket, and guess what it said? God bless this house. I didn't tell her. She bought the sign for us. That sign, if you ever come to my house, is first thing that you see when you walk in the house. I will never remove that sign because that also was a vision that God had given me or a covenant or a signpost or something of faith in my life. I'm, I'm sharing this to just say my life has been a step of faith uh, and I've had, you know, my troubles like everybody, but from one to the next to the next to the next. And I feel like I'm at a point in my life where my faith is really strong. And it's mostly because I trusted and he proved himself. And I trusted again and he proved himself. And I trusted again and he proved himself. So anyway, I met, you know, we're, we're trying to get this house as I'm getting, leaving this church. And uh, waiting for my next assignment as a worship leader. And so I get a phone call from an Assembly of God pastor who's a friend, and I had done some concerts and stuff for his church. And he says, hey, there's a Presbyterian church in Camarillo that really needs a worship leader. And I told him about you, and he wants to meet you. So I said, okay. And I, went, and I didn't even really know anything about the Presbyterian church. I'd been a Baptist most of my life, but had worked with other churches. So anyway, I went out. Next thing I know, I'm leading worship at Trinity Presbyterian in Camarillo. And did that for a while until it was, I knew it was time to go. So I left there and went to go see Tim, who was playing drums for a Free Will Baptist Church in Santa Paula. And I went to go visit him, went out with the pastor afterwards. He begged me to come lead worship at his church. So I did there and I thought, God, I'm just going to serve you wherever you want me. So I'm getting close to the end. <laughs> so I'm working there for a while and I'm thinking, this is not the right place for my family. It's a beautiful church. I love the pastor. You know, everything's wonderful, but I just don't feel like this is where God wants me. So I just finished worship one Sunday and I'm looking down at my shoes and I hear a voice and it says, you're done here. You're done. You did a good job. You're done. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to feel guilty or bad telling them it's time for me to leave because... I really feel like God told me that I'm done. I get home. There's a text. The text is from somebody I know at Bible Fellowship who says there's a church right around the corner, a Presbyterian church that needs a worship leader. And you have to promise me that you're going to apply over there. You're going to put your name in. And guess what church that is? This church. So I didn't... I didn't come looking for this job. I wasn't out looking in classifieds or whatever. I had somebody from another church. And some of you, I know, I think Judy, you know her. It was Connie from Bible Fellowship. And she said, you have to promise me that you're going to put in an application. And I said, yes. And I've been here now for 12 years. And I'm Jimmy Mack. I'm the worship director here at Orchard Community Church. And there is no doubt in my mind that this is where God wants me right now. So my encouragement to you is look for those opportunities. Keep your eyes open. Trust in him. Watch him provide. Watch him tell you where your keys are when you can't find him. I've done that. So how many have done that? It's like you're looking and you're looking. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late. Da, 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 da. It's like, and then you stop. You go, God, please help me find my keys. I got to find my keys. And then boom, there they are. Live your life. Walk in faith. Trust in him. Let him prove to you that he will pro provide. I want to read that scripture one more time. One of my favorite. Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And there's many rewards. One of them is salvation for sure. Right out, right out of the gate. You have guaranteed salvation. When you believe in him and you trust in him and you ask Christ into your heart. But when you live a life of true faith and true belief that he will take care of you, you will get a chance to, and keep your eyes open, spiritual eyes. You will get a chance to see him at work and you will, you will be blessed in that way. Uh, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you even that I had this last minute opportunity to share uh, my story with Orchard Community Church. And I pray that 
the words that I shared ha have touched some people into committing to walking closer in faith to you and trusting in you. Help them to realize, just like I did, that you really do answer prayer and you really do show yourself and you really do take care of us and love us. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in knowing that you are here with us right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and let's sing a closing amen. song. If my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, I'll hold on to what is true, though I cannot see. If the storms of life they come and the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands in faith, I will believe. Even look at look at this song. These are the kind of things that I look at. If if my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, I'll hold on to what is true. Though I cannot see. I picked this song before I even knew I was going to be giving my testimony. And this song rounded up, I mean, put it put it, put the icing on my testimony. And, and God, God knew that. I didn't. But he it just don't let those moments like that pass. Just every moment. Look for his handiwork, look for his blessing. Look for what he's doing in your life. So let me put a blessing on everybody here. Heavenly Father, teach us to walk, truly walk in faith, not just a 
a superficial walk, but a true walk where we see you moving in our lives and we give you the credit with thankfulness. We give you the credit for what you're doing in our lives, Lord, and really, truly walk in faith with you and to share that with other people. I pray all these blessings in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.